Hey guys, welcome back to Tom Girl. We have a very special guest for you this week. We have Seattle Mariners catcher Mike Marjama. Stay tuned. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Oh, yeah. Hey guys, welcome to Tom Girl. I'm your host, JJ Jurgens, and I'm joined here by my co-host tonight. Hi, I'm Hannah B. You can find me on all social media platforms at Hannah B. E. E. Tucker. And we have our sp very special guest, Mike, for you tonight. Mike, where can everybody follow you at? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is Mike.Marjama, and then on Twitter, it's MMarjama. Uh, you can find me on both of those. I'm on Snapchat, too, and all those other things. So you can find me and uh, try to post some good stuff and, <laughs> and have you guys just keep you up with the adventures. Yeah. Well, you, you are very good at that, and you have such a great story to tell. So I just want to dive right into it because I just want you to do the majority of the talking. Oh, here. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I need a sec. I was feeling my walk out there. I was like, <laughs> You guys are like, I love yes. it. And I was yeah, like, that's the point. It's like, we, we want, yeah, we want the fans to be able to just kind of enjoy it, right? Like, yeah. you come with the plate and they're like, oh man, I, I'm really liking this guy. You know, it just, it just, it just adds <laughs> to it. They can relate so. to you in that sense. How, and, and we hear that you may be thinking about a different one for next season. Hey, I'm willing to take suggestions from anybody. If there's anybody oh, out there that's got okay. suggestions for walkout songs, shoot them my way. Get on social mm -hmm. media and, sh and shoot them my way. Like I said, I'm, I'm more than happy. Someone said, uh, was it Carl Carl, Carl Carlton, the bad, she's a bad mamma jamma? Uh -huh. You know, and I was like, oh, that might be a kind of a fun one to play around <laughs> with, you know, you play should. into it a little bit, so... Is yeah. there anybody, anybody on your team who you're like, oh, man, they already got that one. Like, that I love that a, one. That I happens bet. a lot, right? Because then yeah. you're like, you're playing another team, and you're like, I can't steal his, uh -huh. right? You know, uh -huh. and you're like, and you're like I can't take that. his because then it, you know, or like I, you're choosing between two, and then one other guy has on another team, and you're like, huh. Mm -hmm. The worst case scenario is when you choose one, and you choose in between two, and you choose one, and then another guy has it when you go on the road, and you're like, Aww. I should have chose the other one. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. Is it like dibs? You guys call dibs, and like, is it a oh, whole, like a whole competition kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, you know, so like, you know, it's different. Like, you know, Robinson Cano, so Robbie's agent, Jay Z, so he's Jay Z, but he is Jay Z is walking. Like, that's really cool, right? So uh -huh. it's like, I gotta. I don't know. I gotta think of a. I gotta think of a <laughs> yeah. kind of one to come out with. Any Sorry, one that Greg. you guys just kind of make fun of somebody for that, like, is like, oh, they have, you know. Yeah, you know, like, like someone was like, like Miley Cyrus, right. part in the USA or something. <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was like, but Has see, that yeah, see, but for me, that wasn't like rookie ball. Someone had that, oh but I think God. one of the best ones was was it the Sweet Escape? Was it Gwen Stefani? Was the one that oh, had no. it? Was it was like wee, -hoo, yeah, yeah, yeah. wee -hoo, uh -huh. right? That one. But everyone in, and I was like, that's so weird. But everyone in the stands was going wee. -hoo, and I was like, oh so my gosh, this one works. It's perfect. Yeah, so you got to keep that in mind too. What the fans are gonna like get pumped up to, of like really absolutely. Well, you know, we can do it as athletes, right? We want to be the best athlete we can be. We all want to be the LeBron James, the Michael Jordan, right? We want to be these elite, elite athletes. Yeah. Perspectively wise, sometimes it's not always going to happen. But who are we without our fans, right? So you know, our fans are what kind of keep us on the field. It's what allows us to kind of have our job. So. Um, you know, being able to connect with fans, that's that's part of the reason why we do what we do. And, and a mm -hmm. walk-up song, I think, is part of that. Yeah, it's for you, but it's also, you know, hopefully the fans can get some enjoyment out of it. So Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Well, let's go back to kind of your early days sure. of sports. Let's start there. Uh, so let's talk about your high school days. So you did uh, baseball, but also wrestling and other sports as well. Yeah, it started, it started in junior high. I, uh, you know, I tried out for the basketball team my, my seventh and eighth grade year. I played Little League all growing up. And then, like, seventh and eighth grade year, I got cut from the basketball team. I think I was dribbling with my head down or something like that. <laughs> apparently, that apparently, that doesn't work. So, yeah, my, uh, my goal of being in the next Michael Jordan kind of got cut short. So uh, I ended up uh, staying with baseball. And then uh, one of my buddies was like, hey, you should try wrestling. So they needed some guys and uh, ended up getting into wrestling and, and tried that out. So um, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, kind of took me down some dark roads, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time doing it, and, um, you know, all throughout high school, I ended up playing baseball, so. Mm -hmm. um, so to talk about that dark road for a little bit here, because yeah. um, this is something that you're really trying to bring attention to right now, is, is eating disorders, and, and a lot with, with men, because a lot of people do associate eating disorders more with women in, like, fashion industry. I know you right. dealt with it and things like that. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your story? And oh, how, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so it started... Uh, a lot of it was just out of misinformation, I believe, and kind of just, you know, media presence. Um, it started when I was a, in junior high school. Um, I really struggled with, um, you know, I think maybe Hannah relates this a little bit, like Abercrombie had their bags coming out, and all the guys had their shirts mm -hmm. off. But they were guys that, 
realistically weren't what you could expect from yourself. I guess at the time when I was in seventh grade, right? And all the girls were, uh, you know, puberty is kind of kicking in for girls just faster than guys. That's just how it works. And, you know, I was late in that. And so, you know, you saw girls kind of fantasizing about these guys on these Abercrombie bags. And then this girl dated me for like 20 minutes because she felt bad for me. Right. And, and at the time now it's like, oh, whatever. But at the time, I remember thinking and, and now working in substitute teaching in, in junior high schools and high schools, you see how much it affects kids. Just a little thing, maybe a breakup mm-hmm. or or, you know, someone looks at them wrong and they're like their whole day is just devastated by it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, they really affected them. So little things like that kind of affected me. And then, um, you know, I had some some body image issues. I, th- I, I don't like to think of it so much as an eating disorder. I like to think of it more as just a body image issue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people, whether it be we can talk about steroids in, in men or you can talk about, you know, eating disorder with men or, or with women. So those areas are something that that I started digging into. And once I got into wrestling, I learned how to cut weight really good. So mm-hmm. it just made me mm-hmm. a perfectionist at heart. I'm a perfectionist, but um, being able to have those tools to now act on those feelings um, were kind of taking me down those dark paths. Mm-hmm. And then it also caused you, so you missed out on your junior year, which is big for recruiting and yeah. big time in high school. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't play my junior year. I was actually, I was, was seeing a counselor at the time. My parents would kind of know what's going on. And, and I think what really triggered it all was my mom um, made a big Thanksgiving dinner and I put like three carrots on my plate and like three almonds on my plate. And my mom like looked at it and was like, oh, okay, like this is not right. So mm-hmm. I, she had me seeing a counselor. I lost like 14 pounds in a week. And so they put me on a stretcher right there and wheeled me out and then took me to the emergency room and went to an inpatient facility. Um, and I was there with, you know, kids that have overdosed or, you know, tried to commit suicide. Just they weren't safe. You know, they harms themselves or others. Um, I was there for about four or five days. And then I got, um, I was basically let out or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I started an outpatient program. And so during that time in the outpatient program, I went for about six months, three days a week. And um, I wasn't allowed to play baseball. So I missed out on my full junior year. Okay. I never know if I was even going to play again, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a rough time. Yeah. So to bounce back from that, though, so then you did go and play, you know, it's, you, you got past that time, and then you went and you went to college and you played. And so talk about how maybe that moment, how things switched for you and how you turned it around to, like, then fully go after your goals. Yeah, I like to think of it a lot about, like, the recovery side of it is not so much in – an eating disorder perspective. I don't like to think of it as like a physical disorder. Um, I like to think of it more as a mental. It's like, you know, even someone mm-hmm. that has maybe post-traumatic stress. Um, that person is so, you know, I've even heard people explain it to where they just feel locked out. They feel like they're in a gloom. They're just, mm-hmm. they're, they're tired. They just grab a six pack of beer and go hide in a closet and they just want to get away from everybody and seclude themselves because they don't want to be judged and they don't know how to handle it. And that's how I felt mm-hmm. the eating disorder. And any mental thing is like, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm also a perfectionist, and I know what I'm doing, so I'm going to do it better. Mm -hmm. And so then I just get away from everybody. Um, And so for me, getting back into baseball was great because it allowed me to be around people that supported me. And then as I started to learn, in my senior year, I had a great year. I think I hit like 430, but I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get any recruit. I was just a small kid. I hadn't even Mm -hmm. hit puberty by my senior year of high school. I just started to. I definitely delayed it with my eating disorder. So um, it was it was tough. It was a tough time. And then when I got into college, the coping skills I had used from managing my eating disorders had started helping me on the field as well. Maybe being in the present moment, you know, Mm -hmm. you can't, you know, you, the past has already happened, the future, you can't control it. So how can we take care of the present moment right now? And so those things started slowing things down for me. And it not only helped me get over my eating disorder, but also helped me on the field. And then, uh, you know, it's, turned out to be a, a blessing. So I went down some dark roads, but I like to think of it as a great learning experience for myself. And I've, I've gotten a lot of hope out of, out of the things I've learned from it. Mm-hmm. And then you get that call that you get drafted. Like, so talk about that moment and yeah, how, like, how big of... Honestly? Yeah. I was pissed. <laughs> I was pissed. Would it go I, sooner? I thought I was going to go sooner, mm-hmm. and then I had left my house. I had actually left. I was watching the, the, the tracker go down. I was like, mm-hmm. you know, like I just left the house. And I remember my... My parents called and was like, oh, you're just taken by the White Sox. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, like, mm-hmm. whatever. So I didn't, I actually, dis- I didn't sign right away. I went and, and played um, in the Cape Cod League, um, which is like the premier collegiate league. So I went and played for the Orleans Firebirds. And then after uh, about a month or so out there, I ended up signing. Um, I ended up signing out of the Cape Cod League and reported to uh, good old Bristol, <laughs> Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia, around the board on where the NASCAR race is. So that was my first assignment. And uh, I guess that's when my pro ball journey started. Mm-hmm. And 
Go ahead. Yeah, no, I also saw, so you hit your first um, big league home, home run in October, is that right? Yep, October what 1st. Was, what was that experience like? Oh, gosh. Um, it's pretty surreal, right? Because you, like, you think about it in your, in your mind, you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I wonder if I will ever be able to play in the big leagues, right? And then, or I even play pro ball, mm -hmm. and then can I even play in the big leagues? And then you get to big leagues, and like, you know, I hit a home run. And I think what made it even more surreal was that my family was able to be there. So I have a lot of family. It's in like Huntington Beach, down south here, and and then my my family was able to fly down. My parents were able to fly down for that. So um, it was really cool to be able to do that in front of them. A lot of family friends were there, and you know, I remember, cool. yeah, mm -hmm. I remember one of the. Uh, one of the things was a family friend was filming my at bats down the left field line. They got tickets down the right field line, and they're filming the at bat, and all of a sudden the ball gets hit, and and they had their whole family with them, and their son is a model down here, and he was taking the video of it on his phone, and you know they they see it hit, and he's like, oh my gosh, and the ball goes out, and then their daughter goes, oh. <laughs> and you know and her dad's like no you ruined it oh, you know like so, so it was funny. it was funny but it's like you know those things are just they're priceless moments that you just you know it's like for me I don't like to think of it as myself right like right. is it great that it hit a home run absolutely but I don't deserve it it's like my family deserves it my family's been there with yeah. me since I was you know my family had to go through hospitalizations with me for my eating disorder and now all of a sudden they're able to walk into a big league ballpark and, and see their son on the big screen and, and see it, you know, mm -hmm. name, you know, my mom gets to have a Marjama jersey, you know, it's, that to me, you know, it's like that, you know, that, that tears me up a little bit, you know, being able to see those things for my mom and my dad and, and all my grandparents, the people that have been along me the whole ride. So, yeah, they've been there for you. Yeah, yeah, so for them to experience that moment was, it was surreal. And I think like what I want to talk about too is as how you keep so mentally tough, because before you hit that home run, like it said, you had seven seasons in the minors, 480 games at five levels of minor league ball. Like, the, I mean, that's, it's a long time you waiting to have, you know, for that moment and to be, you know, yeah. up there. So how, how did you stay tough during that time? And yeah, mentally, it's um, a secret. Yeah, it's a secret. <laughs> gonna, yeah, no, um, I think just faith. I just had faith and I had hope and I had I, I've always been the hardest worker. When I was with the White Sox, I got uh, Dale Torberg was our strength and conditioning coach, and he was a, used to be a WWE wrestler. He was the demon. So every year he would pass out a weight belt, which was the big, you know, wrestling belt, and had the White Sox on it. Hard. Well, I got the hardest working player in the organization, and everywhere I've gone, I feel like I've always been the hardest worker, whether it be high school or college or what. I just that's that's always been my personality. So. I always knew I could, and now that took me down some dark roads, mm -hmm. you know, I could have an disorder, but I did it better than, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> right. But um, that's also, that's just was the way my personality was. So when I got, there have been times like this year to start the year, I was supposed to be off the roster on the Phantom deal, which means I'm healthy, but they don't have a spot for me. Well, on our first bus ride down to Gwinnett, it was like, hey, you're active now. But at that time I had to be like, you know what? I need to slow down and just, hey, God's got a plan for you. Just mm -hmm. breathe like relax and take it day by day. And so what it kept reminding me is be in the present moment. I can't control where I'm at, but I can control how I go, my, my, go about my business. So every day I showed up at the ballpark, I was like, I'm gonna be the hardest worker here. I'm gonna prove that I belong. Mm -hmm. and, and so I like to think about it as just very proactive. You know, instead of thinking like, oh, woe is me. It's like, no, okay, like what, what can I do next that's gonna get me there? Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately at the end of the day, as an athlete, and I think as you would know, it just kept me sharp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially, I, I'm always big on that, too. So I feel like that's the one thing you can control is how hard you work and what you bring to the table, like, every single day. And, and how do you see that in other athletes? Because at that level, you, you have a lot of egos or you have a lot of distractions or the money and the fame, and, you know. Yeah, you know, so our clubhouse is very different. So a lot of people, we don't spend a lot of time with our families, you know, per se. We don't, we don't really get to, right? So we play... You know, our season, yeah, we have our off season for, you know, maybe October, November through February where we get to do whatever we want, which is great. You know, I get to come and do stuff like this, which is awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, but during the season, we have maybe, you know, maybe one day off a week, maybe not even that, you know, maybe once every two weeks. So we only get a few days off a month. So every day we're at the ballpark from 12 or from noon, maybe till about 11 o'clock at night for the most part. So during that time, we spend a lot of time with our guys, right? So not with our yeah. family. So they become our family, and we try to influence each other the great way. And the great teams always seem to have great camaraderie. I think it's with anything, in business, in, in whatever you're doing, that camaraderie that you have with each other definitely helps. So we push each other definitely harder, right? If, if a guy like, um, 
you know, not to try to like name drop here, like Robinson Cano is in the cage or Felix Hernandez is pitching or any of these big, big, big name players are doing something, I had better be out there too doing it because there's a reason they're that good. There's a reason they're mm -hmm. at that level. And we as a team continue to push each other that way because, you know, at, at our level, it's no longer about developing, it's about winning. And so our job is to go out there and win and compete and, and put up the numbers. So, um, you know, whatever we can do to help each other win and be the best team we can be is, is really what, what it boils down to. So we keep each other sharp. And, you know, mm -hmm. if something is out of line, um, you know, the veteran guys let you know and mm -hmm. you, you take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, do you switch positions? You didn't always start out as a catcher. Yeah. Can, how was that transition for you? Ooh, tough. <laughs> I like to think of myself not as a catcher, more as a squatting infielder. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I was a third baseman. Uh, mm -hmm. I, was a sh I was actually a second baseman in, in high school. Um, I was really short. I mean, give you like visuals. I guess I was probably about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, 130 my junior year. Granted, the eating disorder definitely played into that. Um, you know, my senior year, I was about 5'11 or so, 160. I started growing. And then finally we got to college. I was like, okay, I'm 6'2", 6'3", 200. You know, I started growing into my body, I guess, you know. The, so, I, you know, I, my body just translated to third base. And then um, when I was at Long Beach State, just one of the days they were like, hey, you going to try catching? I was like, uh, sure. You, I mean, you could maybe do it. And so uh, I threw on the gear. And uh, so in pro ball, I was kind of drafted as a catcher, third baseman. My first year I played third. And then um, – Next year, the White Sox threw some catcher's gear in my locker, and I've been kind of bouncing around back and forth since. So this is about my third year in a row really strictly catching. So I'm still relatively new to the position, but um, I can't let it show. Yeah. You know, it's all about just performing now and just doing what we can. So Skill-wise, what things did you have to pick up? Because I read, like, when you were second baseman, you used to study where the batters, where they would for their percentage of where they would hit to and you could tell other players where to move to and things. Yeah. So what? How, how did that mentality switch when you are a catcher? What kind of things did you have to pick up on and learn? Well, I'm a complete, I'm a cerebral player. Like I like to think of myself as a, I, I like to think I'm decently smart. So, you know, and I, I try to think things through. So uh, one of my big things now is we get huge scouting reports on every team we're playing. So we have big old lists of, hey, pitch here, pitch here. We have, you know, a big, big video room with, we can just study hitters and all of a sudden, where are holes? What does this guy do? So. For me, as a catcher, you're the commander on the field, right? So every pitch, like coaches don't call pitches, we call pitches, right? So mm -hmm. I have to know what the pitcher likes to throw, what he wants to throw, what this hitter can't hit, why can't he hit it, you know, is he in a slump, is he over 10, he's really hitting this pitch. So there's a lot of different factors that go in, right? So mm -hmm. that's where for me is you have to be extremely prepared. And so I like to think I overwork, but to me that just gets me prepared and, and forming those relationships with the pitchers to make sure I'm pitching to their strengths and and allowing them to uh, to be successful and the best time that you know the best thing we can do as a catcher is almost be invisible like you don't know we're there mm -hmm. and that's like the biggest thing it's like look how well that pitcher pitched and it's like not to take credit away from any of our pitchers but it's yeah. like but you know it's like that's our best thing is like you know you don't even know we're there you're just watching the pitcher do his thing and dominate and then it's just like you know at the end of the day the pitchers know that you know we definitely mm -hmm. have helped out part of mm -hmm. it but you know, that's, that's one of the things I, d I love about it and, and picking up how to call a game. And, and that's where learning from, from veterans is huge. One of the articles about you, they called you the relationship guru because of your relationship with those pitchers. So, um, it, and also how you let, you said you liked people. And so how has your kind of skills, your people skills and what you, you know, enjoy about life, like help you relate to being like the one that the, the pitchers you know, yeah. want, want there for them. Yeah, I mean, I've tried to use that at a bar a lot. And they're like, hey, you know I'm the relationship guru? And they're like, oh, please, save it, buddy. You know? Valentine's <laughs> Day is coming up. It Just is. Do maybe. Maybe I can start my own show, The Relationship Guru, or there something you go. like that. I see no. a podcast oh, in your stop future. It. Stop <laughs> it. Will, Will Smith has me. He's hitched. I can't, I can't even compete with that man. Bachelor, He's... next bachelor, you know. Maybe. Oh, yeah, that too. Oh. Oh, that's a, we'll have to save that for a different story. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, if you guys are watching, please don't put me on the back. No, uh, Agent. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, it, oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah, you, yeah, let's, yeah, let's just, let's just pass on that one. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, for people who have gone through what you've, you're, you know, you've been through, um, who need a piece of advice, like, what's the biggest piece of advice you think you could give them? You know, I think, like I said before, I, I, you know, the eating disorder is a great way to, to describe it because that's that's what I went through. But I like to think, I, you know, I had a lot of body image issues, and I think that's something that doesn't really get addressed. We try to define someone as okay, this person's anorexic, just clinically. Mm -hmm. That's just how you know diagnosis works. 
But a lot of times it all just stems from, you know, a body image issue or, mm -hmm. you know, a way it is. And when that brain gets malnourished, your brain doesn't work the same way, right? So um, an, an example would be, and this will get to where I'm going to go with this, is I thought that in order to get really shredded, if I didn't eat anything and I worked out a bunch, I would work out and get big and strong. And if I didn't even eat, eat anything, I wouldn't get fat. Well, when that wasn't working, I was like, okay, I'm not doing this right. I need to eat even less and work out more. Well, when that wasn't working, I'm going to eat even less and work out more. And pretty soon I was on this downward, downward mm -hmm. spiral. So the biggest thing that I would say to somebody is that, look, there's, there's help. If, if I wouldn't have been so stubborn and felt like I had all the answers and I would have been more open to saying, okay, you know what? I think the way I'm thinking about myself isn't healthy why isn't it healthy? Okay, it's okay to have these feelings and thoughts, but how we act on those thoughts is where we kind of draw the line and say, okay, are we doing something in a positive light or are we doing it in a negative light? And so my, you know, kind of goal for everything that I'm trying to push here is that people, when you see this happening, whether it be an eating disorder, maybe a PTSD, maybe you're just maybe struggling with depression, is there's help. There are resources out there to help you, and all you have to do is just ask for it. And, and there's more than enough people. You know, I, I've had so many people reach out on, on Twitter and Instagram saying, hey, I think I know somebody that's suffering from this. You know, mm -hmm. what can you do? And I was like, you know, it, it, the most important thing is for them to, to want that help and just to kind of make that acknowledgement. And, and so that's the thing I ask those people is, hey, just please, like, just reach out to one of us because, you know, I know for me, if I had someone I could have talked to about this that maybe was in my position, this maybe wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Or at least I could have learned from it sooner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As your, I know you're a substitute teacher as well. Which yes. That's pretty awesome. Um, how much do you see social media also playing in fact for the kids th these days? You know, it's it's social media is it's great. It's 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 wonderful, right? Because we have a fan can have an instant connection with me as an athlete. I love that. I want mm -hmm. fans to be able to to have access to my life, um, for the most part. Um, <laughs> but nice but also we can portray certain things, and I think where a lot of of media has gone is we we glorify certain figures physiques which is natural that's just the way our our system works right mm -hmm. but it's so hard to be i'll give you a great example on sports center the other night there was a guy that shoots a half court shot and he's on the not top 10 on friday well not because he shot a half court shot because he takes his shirt off but he was what we would call overweight or what mainstream but he's out dancing having a good time mm -hmm. shooting the shot and no one goes hey look there's this happy guy that just missed a half court shot they go he's on not top 10 not because of his half court shot attempt but because he took a shirt off and he's dancing around like an idiot because they think he's overweight like yeah. what are we sending to the little kid there yeah, that's watching that and not right. saying we can't be thick skinned and, and any of that I, I get where a lot of things mm -hmm. come from but what happens to that little kid that goes, wait, I kind of look like, well, now they're just ridiculing this guy. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that, what message does right. that give to that kid? And so those are the things that for me are like, uh, you know, I don't know how that's good. And a lot of that gets pushed on social media. So we have instant gratification on a lot of things with social media, but it also portrays a, a, a rough image. So that's where, um, you know, we've been working with, with a couple organizations and trying to figure out a, a good way to represent kind of what, what I want to and hopefully you know, impacting lives for, you know, healthy, active lifestyles, mm -hmm. which is something I think we would all love to see. Yeah, for sure. And I know on your social media, uh, there's, you post a lot of motivational, um, motivational quotes, inspirational yeah. things. I think we had, a, uh, I have a couple on here too. That would be Stephen number, uh, oh, photo like four. That. Yeah. Like, um, oh, this, this one. I, I like pulled. this one. This Working one. I, yeah. yeah. I love yeah. that. One. That's my favorite. Yeah, and then this one, um, be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. That one's yeah. really good. Yeah, I just that one was just one thing I just I always love. I just did the Seattle Mariners caravan here up in, up in Washington, and we got to go around a bunch of local elementary schools and hospitals and see kids and, and you know and just see fans right and be on their home fields like I would like to say right. So everyone comes mm -hmm. to Seattle to see us, but we have such a, a really broad fan base that we're able to kind of go to their home fields and be able to kind of give back to them. So. It was a great opportunity to go do that, and I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super cool. Just give back. And was it like a full tour? How long? Yeah, so it was a week long. A week, week long, long, we went all over the state of Washington. So um, it was really cool to be able, like I said, go around and just see people on their home fields and in their hometowns, right? So I'd mm -hmm. driven through a lot of those places, but I never got to stay the night, you know, or see any of the local stuff. So that was really, really cool to be able to do that and, and just share, 
you know, we're normal people. I'm a normal dude. You can mm -hmm. see me on the street. I'm not like, you know, we're just normal people. So, you know, I want people to be able to relate to me and talk to me about things. And that's what substitute teaching does too for me. Mm -hmm. um, how much more of this, of is this kind of your mission now, um, like using your platform that you have with the team and in baseball to like, you know, give back and, and oh, never ending, never ending. This is something that does, it won't stop. You know, and that, and that's my thing is like, how can we, you know, for the rest of my life, it's it's. I like to think of living a purpose driven life. Like my purpose isn't to to play baseball. That's not my purpose in life because in the big scheme of things, baseball lasts like this much of my life, right? It's such a small part of it, and I like to think of myself not as a baseball player. I'm a hopefully I'm just a really cool, good dude that plays baseball. Not mm -hmm. the baseball player that did this or did that. You know, it's like, so that's how I like to define myself. And, and more or less, I, you know, I really hope that what this does, you know, can impact some lives. And, you know, working with the National Eating Disorder Association, and, you know, I just got named their Spirit of Courage Award um, for the mm -hmm. year. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll be honored right. in New York for that. So I think it's going to be kind of a cool thing to have on. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, knowing that what I'm doing right now is impacting lives and getting the recognition that, that these people are like, hey, you know what, like, you opening up and, and coming out with this stuff is really helping some people. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what it's all about. It's, I can lock myself up and go somewhere. But you know, I, I think interdependence is huge, right? Being able to mm -hmm. interact with people and just spread positivity, spread joy and something that we're so driven negatively on a lot of issues is, you know what, let's bring some smiles, let's bring some fun. And, and just and you know, I hope maybe my positive energy and I'm like the Energizer Bunny, you know, it's like, <laughs> nonstop go, but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully that will bring some light to some little kids and say, you know what, like they're struggling with something and go, you know what, like I see Mike, he's having a lot of fun. Like, what is he doing right now? And then they look on maybe social media because, you know, they're like, man, he's doing that. Let's let's try that. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. where we're trying to grow things and just and just give people an all access look at, at what I do. And, and not that it's really anything glamorous. It's just normal everyday life. But how can we look at it in a really cool light? And, I well, and I think it's I just think it's so brave and I think it's so great that you're sharing that about your past you know because um, it, it's hard for a lot of, a lot of people to share and very personal you know for you but I think yeah just the, the lives that you are touching and can touch and I think you know it's it's great to look at people where everything is going great for them and they're the top athletes and they've always been like the top of their game all the time you know but I think that the story that you have like having to sit out that year and then not being not being getting recruited for college but saying I still I still want this and going after it, you know I think that gives people a lot of a lot of light and hope knowing that even if there's a time in your life where maybe things didn't go aren't going the way you want there's no you don't have to stay in that cycle absolutely. you can change it absolutely mm -hmm. I think you know it's just being proactive is I think one of the big things that helped me is you have the you have a choice right so like every day you wake up you have a choice on how you feel and how you act and for me it's taking the switch and you know a lot of times I look in the mirror right and have like these really bad images of myself and I would go you know what like it's not that bad like so I take post-its and put posts up with, like a smiley face you know or say like mm -hmm. you know like dude you're awesome you know and you put a post-it mm -hmm. up there and you know I'd like that was one of my coping skills that we had doing in class but I still was like that's actually kind of a cool idea so yeah. you know it's like throw yeah. some stuff up and be like dude you're the man like you can do this and yeah. it just gives you that positive you know hopefully like I said that's what I want to spread to people and and just that, that love and joy and, you know, and positivity and, and let people just, you know, shine a light, shine a light and let other people, you know, shine theirs as well. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that was one of the questions I meant to ask you. Are there any other coping or, or tools that you use or things that you could share with people? Yeah, I, I journal, you know, I journal. I like to read now. I never liked to read before. And I like to just, you know, I think of just adding to my knowledge bank and adding to, you know, just adding information. If, if I can learn something new every day, I'm like, you know what, oh, goodness, like, I'm going to be a lot better off. And so a lot of things I thought were just misinformation, the way that I had kind of portrayed myself or thought about myself. And, and um, you know, the ways I did that were just, it was, like I said, so unhealthy. So my ways mm -hmm. of finding these healthy outlets to do it, whether it be maybe um, finding more active stuff to do, maybe go hiking, go kayaking, you know, take the boat out, do something fun and, and interactive where I can still have this active, healthy lifestyle, but not take it to these really bizarre extremes. Mm -hmm. What do you do as far as um, like nutrition and workouts when uh, you're off season? Yeah, now? so it's it's hard balancing the life of a trying to be a the elite athlete, right? Being one of the best sixty, you know, in the world at what you do mm -hmm. is very very tough. Plus, being you know having gone through an eating disorder, is, you know, is 
you know, are you restricting? Are you doing those things? So I don't battle with the eating disorder stuff anymore, but what I've tried to do is use it for my knowledge. So when I had my eating disorder, a lot of time I walk through the grocery store and go, I'm not allowed to have that. I'm not allowed to have that. I'm not allowed to have that. I can't have that. I can't have that. I'm not going down that aisle, right? You know what I mean? Like, I know what's bad if I go down that aisle, right? So instead it's like, okay, and I used to think of food, right? You, I used to like, if you made a, uh, for example, Atkins diet became a big one yeah. when, when I had mine, right? So the Atkins diet come out and everyone's like, no carbs, no carbs, no carbs. Wow. And so all of a sudden you see a hamburger and you're like, I can't have the bun, I can't have that. And you're just like, well, what the heck can I eat? So many uh, cans. Yes, yeah. and there's so many cans. Yeah, let's turn it yeah. around and then think positive. What can I have? And mm-hmm. then a hundred percent. And yeah. so now being an elite athlete, I'm like, okay, so I need micronutrients. So now it's like, I love berries. I love raspberries, blueberries, but I love I love fruit. I love vegetables. I love so now it's like what does my body need to perform at the highest level? Well, I need healthy fats. I need I need carbs. I need protein. Mm-hmm. I need all these different sources. So now I've noticed is like I've I've learned that through through looking for things that my body needs, I'm eating a lot more balanced, healthy meals. Rather than thinking, I can't have that, I can't have that, I can't have that, it'd be like, I'd open up a can of tuna and be like, well, I can't have this. And you're like, <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, and none of us are like, yeah, yeah, great, yeah. you know? But it's like, oh, okay, I need carbs, I need this. So it's like, I love making like chicken tortilla soup at home. Like that's one of my big ones. And I'm like, I love that because it's like, it's easy to make, but it has everything I need. And I can change it up or I can use, like Costco, they sell rotisserie chicken and it's like, it's good too. yeah, so then that's like, and they sell like the meat, they pull it apart, they sell it in the package, so I'm like, yeah. okay, I can use that for something, you know, I can use that for a salad or something, so, you know, and then I just add to it, like, I really want to make a, you know, an omelet, so I add different kinds of peppers, because I want to hit different micronutrients, it's, like I said, it's just adding things and thinking it, like Hannah said, in a positive light, mm-hmm. thinking of things that my body needs to perform, and when I did that, it's like, I perform better, I feel a whole heck of a lot better, and I know my brain's working in the right way. Mm-hmm. And I know I've been through this too, it's like just listening to your body and like, okay, I feel like I should be eating this today. Like literally, like you just kind of listen, oh, I'm thirsty, like I should actually be drinking water. Like those are things that people don't think about and don't do enough too. And you know, I have experienced some of that through modeling kind of as you, mm-hmm. you mentioned a little bit there. So, so I can relate in that sense as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, and what you, what you said hit the nail on it. I mean, it's, it's, you look at things so different, like, you know, for mm-hmm. a different lens. And, and, and sometimes we have these paradigms and we just need a little paradigm shift to say, mm-hmm. you know what, like, we look at something and it, it's maybe flawed. And maybe if we just change the way we can look at something, you know, whether it be in, in, in the political sense, in a lot of different yeah. senses, if we just look at something and say, you know, with, with a lot of sexual harassment stuff, sex, any of this stuff going on, mm-hmm. let's, let's take away and let's shift the light and say, how can we look at this differently and, and embrace it? And I think by doing that, hopefully we can bring a lot of positive change. Yes. Completely. I agree. And I think people are ready for that. I think we've I, kind of, as I a nation, so. all been through a lot of this ne- negativity. I think Absolutely. a lot of people are looking for that and ready. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So hopefully we can be just, you know what, like I said, it, it maybe do I change everything? No, but like I'm, I'm not looking to do that. But hopefully, you know, if, if I reach just one person, if one person can get help by that, mm-hmm. then, then, then my mission's done. You know, and, yeah. and obviously awesome. we're trying to reach a lot more people. But, um, you know, I just want to be a source, like I said, of light and, and the positivity and, just, and, and encourage people. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah. All right, let's switch gears just a little Switching bit here. Okay. Tell them, girl, we got to talk a little bit of fashion since we have the yes. fashion correspondent here. Yes. So let's do, we're going to do break down the SAG Awards. You have okay, some I'm ready. dress selections that you liked yes. from this last weekend. All right, yes. I'll let you go to town. All right, well, I picked a couple of my top favorites from the SAG Award red carpet. So first we have Tracy Ellis Ross. She's in Ralph and Russo. So Ralph and Russo has been all over the red carpets. Uh, this award season and I'm super excited I love I just love their design so I'm really happy for them Um, and she's 45 she looks stunning in this Um, from you know the ruching around her waist it's just plays so nicely and um, I also love the fact that um, it's just kind of wearing like she's very on trend with her off the shoulder Mm -hmm. cape train is what I'm calling it Um, but she's kind of playing on the um you know women empowerment you know what's going on with um hashtag me too and stuff like that with this um strong shoulder cape almost looks like their shoulder pads and i don't think there Mm -hmm. is but uh she's just wearing it very well um if i'm gonna be like nitpicky though um i would say that maybe the stylist should have um the hem is peeling like where her slit is Mm -hmm. i would say kind of fix that but other than that she looks so stunning i don't know what you what do you think yeah, I do too. Like 
Uh, yeah, like she looks back, fantastic. <laughs> Feel free to go to your next. Too, yeah, I know. No, she <laughs> looks good. That's how I was gonna like, wow, that's pretty good looking right there. <laughs> that works for me. Awesome. Yeah, no, well, that's good. And yeah. next we have Yar Shahidi. She's wearing Ralph Lauren. This is a custom piece, um, and they people are like, "Oh my gosh, she's giving total Diana Ross vibes," which I think she yeah. is. Um, and she's 17. She's cute, killing the red carpet. When I was 17, I was like, "What's a red carpet?" I don't know. <laughs> that smile right there. But, yeah, yeah, gigantic, she's, she's gorgeous, gigantic. gorgeous, and yeah. um, I love the juxtaposition of this outfit. She's Tom Girl. Little tongue girl there, mm -hmm. and uh, also has this huge feminine bow that's just a knockout piece. And the train, of course, you can never yep. you can never go wrong with the train. Yep. So um, I just love that piece very much. Um, and then next we have Allison Williams. I'm dying over this. It's kind of like old Hollywood um, meets uh, almost like a flapper girl, mm -hmm. but it's not too costumey. And this is also did I say Ralph and her? So yeah, so they. Um, one thing I love about them is that they always pay so close attention to detail, so it makes it look expensive and luxurious. And her lipstick, guess how much her lipstick cost? Less than ten dollars. No, oh. I was gonna say here the, for the future of my life, I hope it's not that expensive. <laughs> I, I thought you were gonna say really expensive, oh, no, so no. I was like, oh no. I was gonna say, um, no, it's actually not. It's only six dollars. So I'm like, okay, I bought like red lipstick the other day, and it was thirty-five dollars from Givenchy. I'm like, what am I doing? She looks amazing and knows how to make you know something that's not expensive expensive. Uh, next, we have Juliana Rancic and Stephen Khalil. Uh, sequins we always see on the red carpet, so I'm I'm really excited to see this different take on it, um, and this is also a classy take as well because usually it can go tacky, it can go downhill pretty fast. Uh, but this looks fantastic with the geometric patterns, and it's a little bit sheer as it the you know dress goes down, but she has a high neckline, so that um, you know is a great contrast there and a little peak of the shoulder. I love that little. That shoulder one was my attitude. favorite of the day. Yeah, yeah, no. you can yeah. have it on there. Um, and then we have Uzo Aduba, and she's in Christian Siriano. At first, I was like, oh, this is totally bridesmaid. And uh, I kept looking at it, and I was like, wait, is that crazy eyes? I was like, no way. She looks stunning. <laughs> um, but again, we have that on trend with the one shoulder cape, and her hair just looks fabulous, and it totally complements the one shoulder neckline there. So, And it's a great color on her as well. And then we threw this one in as a bonus because yes. Millie Bobby Brown, we had to give it to her because she's bringing the converse she, onto the carpet. This is like the one <laughs> exception, awesome. the one exception, you know, she can wear the converse. It's okay. Yep, but no, that's she, the Tom girl, mixing almost, the, mixing yeah, the dress it. with the it. sporty shoes. So like cute. It. She's adorable. So we're going to segue I this into it. talking I a little baseball it. fashion <laughs> oh, no, here. Please don't. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, so we man. talked a little bit before the interview. I want to bring this one back up because we had a little debate here about the baseball pants. Oh, gosh. So the baseball butt. The, yeah, the baseball okay, butt there we go. and oh, the yeah. stirrups. More or less. Okay. There's a whole story. So, yes, because I am a fan of the old school stirrups and what me and your agent's wife agreed on is because they made the pants were a little tighter and it made them a little show off the butts a little bit. We're just going to say it here because that's what we do. Because baseball butts, girls like. I'm so. glad we can say that. Okay, yeah, that's that's uh, more or less, yes. That is true. But now you like you, that's why you like patting, the new hat That's why I've been pants, patting or? my butt for like four years now. But, I mean, who's, who's keeping track of that? No. <laughs> do you prefer the, the pants where you had the stirrups, or do you like the new, like, you with know, the long So pants? my whole career we've worn, I wore pants down with stirrups, or sorry, pants up with stirrups. I was uh -huh. college, like all my whole college career. And then when I first started playing, I was like, I had my pants up. And then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to wear my pants down. But everyone has their pants down now. So I'm like, yeah, I just, I've started wearing my pants down. Pants up for me, I don't know, maybe like make it shorter. But pants up, you gotta have really good calves. And for me, <laughs> like, if not, they, the pants just fall down, right? You gotta have something to hold yeah. them up there. So, uh, yeah, my calf game is, I think it's average. average. So, <laughs> maybe a C or B. Yeah, probably about a C. I don't know. Maybe we can rate that on the next fashion thing. Okay, <laughs> okay, right, right, there we go. <laughs> okay. I got that covered. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Yeah, so. Yeah, but, you know, I think fashion and baseball is fun because we're trying to bring a whole new... We want, you know, the, maybe the bat flips and all this stuff. We're trying, we, we want it to be fun for fans, right? That's what, you know, as players, we, we interact with our fans, too. That's part of it. And, then you know, you start seeing guys with, like, these big neon colors and our cleats and everything. And I mm -hmm. always love, like, white uniform with white cleats. I mean, I don't know what you get. It just blends with mm -hmm. the pants. It looks yeah. all one piece. And I like... I mean, I'm very simple with my style. You know, like, one person that mentioned style to me is, like, the classics never go out of style. 
And so Mm -hmm. I'm very much like, I try to be that way. And so when I look at stuff, I like to just wear very solid stuff. I'm not a big flashy guy. Um, So I just kind of stick with the basics. But, you know, we have guys that that add their own unique flair, which is awesome because in a game where we all wear the same uniform, uh, Mm -hmm. being able to spice it up kind of your own ways, you know, is really, really cool. That's fun, yeah. In your everyday life, what kind of, what's your style? I like my tan suede Chelsea boots. Those are my go-tos. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I rock those. Uh, I'm a big Hudson jeans guy. Um, uh, shoot, I'm trying to think T-shirt of all the things. I, okay, yeah. I'm a T-shirt. shoe hoarder. I, I okay. have a ton of shoes. I have a ton of shoes. Um, probably more than I probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I can understand. I can understand. Yeah, so, uh, I but I, you know what? I never really gotten into fashion, and then now that I've started to you know, I was just, it's easier. Social media now gives a great outlet to be able to just see what guys wear. So, and it's able to do it kind of, you know, reasonably affordably. You know, the minor leagues, mm-hmm. like, we didn't have a lot of money. So how can we, you know, make ourselves look like a professional, but on a budget? You know, right. I think of, like, balling on a budget. or right. You know, it's, no, it's just exactly. like, exactly. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, so, you know, it's just trying to be, trying to be great about, you know, what we're doing. And like I said, this big flash really wasn't my thing. So it was like, I, could, I just think solid colors for me and, and, you know, hopefully just not try to stand out too much, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> what about accessories? Because the baseball chain's always something. Oh, How, what few. thought goes into the, yeah. yeah. See, I got a few. Yeah, I got my cross. So, and tell my, us why you picked the these same. chains. These are two I've had for a long time, but I'm not, like I said, I'm not a big flashy, like, you know, I'm going to pop these big chains out. You know, it's mm-hmm. it, it's definitely, a, a, you know, in, in our, like, Latino culture, it's just very, you know, it's the... The culture is a little more flamboyant, which is, it's really cool. So I got to go to the Dominican Republic, um, you know, this winter. It, it was awesome to be able to experience that culture because you get to see how culturally it's different. I think that's one of the great parts about America itself is we're so culturally diverse in a, in a way that everyone gets to bring their own unique vibe. So it's funny, you know, going through these dresses and everything and watching people see, you know, you people get to bring their own style and flare it up. And, you know, and that's the best part about fashion, right? Is this mm-hmm, being exactly. able to portray yourself outwardly. You know, it's like same with tattoos. Like I have tattoos, but they all portray yeah. something different. And I think mm-hmm. that's one of the great parts about fashion that I've started to learn. But uh, like I said, I'm not even close to your guys. So I'll, <laughs> I'll heed to your guys' expertise on, on that issue. I was going to ask, t- t- tell us about your tats. Oh, Where's... I got a bunch. Uh, I got my whole back is pretty much done. And then uh, a lot of the ones that I have, like on the insides, like this estate, I've got pretty much Jesus walking the beach, going on water. Um, the clipper ship just to find my way. So a lot of it, everything that I have, I've got some angel wings across on my back and then cool. uh, last name and just a bunch of stuff. But uh, one that goes down my spine. So, I mean, I have a bunch of different stuff, but my Achilles are done. Um, they mm-hmm. all have meaning to me and they're all pretty much based around my family and faith. And those are the two things that were always been my kind of my foundation. And those are things I never felt like were going to change. So for mm-hmm. me is is just knowing and maybe it's just the symbolism of it but putting it on my body and saying you know what like these are my these are my rocks these are things that have grounded me and these are things that keep me going so it's a daily reminder of the motivation but also a daily reminder of of humbling myself um knowing that you know no matter where you get in life you know you've always come from somewhere and 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 keeping that in mind Mm -hmm. great all right Let's. Uh, I see a picture we have up there now. Let's oh talk a little bit. We lost, also like to talk adventure here. So Ooh, I ripped I love this it. one from your Twitter account, I believe. <laughs> okay. So um, and you have to pronounce this. I know it's Idaho, I but I'm like Coeur I don't know. Yeah. Coeur yeah, Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, that's in Idaho. It's a beautiful, beautiful resort. They're they're known for a golf course there. It has a uh, for anyone that really likes the golf. There's a uh, island green where they actually take you on a ferry out from on shore out to the island green. So you have to ride a little ferry boat out to the <laughs> green. Cool. So you get your tee shot and then you. <laughs> So it's known for that, but it's a very, very, very nice summer resort. I would highly recommend. The Mariners did us uh, the luxury of putting us in uh, the the resort there, and and it was beautiful. That was a room. That was my view from mm-hmm. my balcony there, yes. uh, looking awesome. out over the lake. So uh, we got to stay there for a few nights and, and visit with some of the fans in near Spokane. There, um, it's right across the border from Washington. So it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful area. Um, I recommend anyone going there in the summer. In the mm-hmm. summer is beautiful, but in the winter is nice. There's a little snow flurry that went over the lake, and oh, really, really beautiful. Cool. Nice. Are there any other spots that you've been to? Or are you an adventure person, or what kind of things do you like to do? You know, so do? I haven't really got to go on much international travel. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen pretty much everywhere in America, being in like you know seven years in the minor leagues. I've played in <laughs> I've played in every state in I've played in every place imaginable. Um, I've been to like Mexico, and I now I've gone to the Dominican Republic. So mm-hmm. that was a really really cool trip. And you know, I loved I would love to do Greece. I love to do Italy. I love to do mm-hmm. the the Mediterranean there, uh, Turkey. I think that'd be a really fun trip to do and I you know I've always wanted to do like Thailand and, and do mm-hmm. that trip too but 
you know, I think the Dominican Republic was a great lesson for me in learning how to, um, not many people spoke English. Um, I wasn't in a resort. I was in downtown Santo Domingo. So it was, I mean, I was in the city. Mm -hmm. And so learning how to have to travel and communicate and go to the grocery store and, and, and being able to communicate my way through. And I speak, you know, decent Spanish is very broken, but, um, you know, it was cool to see how their culture works and, and knowing that the ways that it's opened my mind. The ways that I see things sometimes are seen in a totally different light. Mm -hmm. And and it was very humbling. So like I said, I, I recommend, you know, people just go out and, and be able to hopefully experience a new culture, not not just in the States, but abroad. Yeah. And I think you can learn some great things, not only about the other cultures, but kind of about yourself too. So for it was sure. a very humbling experience. Yeah, for sure. It's great to get out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we're gonna play a quick game if Let's you're up it. for it before we wrap up tonight. So we'll just alternate asking. So we're okay. calling this the fastball round. Oh god. I'm trying to peek over there. Hope it's not Edwin <laughs> Diaz's fastball. Yeah, don't throw a curveball on me here. <laughs> okay. So we're just quick missing. questions, whichever comes to you to mind. Okay. 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 Beer or whiskey? Whiskey. Country music or rock? Country. Lakes or oceans? Lake. What are you afraid of? Ooh, spiders <laughs> and snakes. Uh, your most annoying habit? Who biting my fingernails. <laughs> Favorite baseball stadium? Ooh, oh, Safeco. Where's your happy place? Ooh, Lake Tahoe with my grandparents. That's, That's it. it. That's it? Yeah. Oh, my God. That easy. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel it. I was like, yeah. Oh, That's my funny. gosh. <laughs> that was a good game. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that, good music, Stephen. Yeah, I was going to say, you're keeping me on my toes right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, I like it. You got all tense. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, trying to think of this. Like, I, I can't give the wrong answer right now. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, All right, well, just to wrap up, because I think we only have about five minutes left, but I just want to talk about what's up, upcoming things for you, and I know you have a documentary you just shot uninterrupted. Can you tell us a little bit about the documentary? Yeah, so there's a lot of big things coming out now, so it's it's awesome. Um, I, ve I feel very, very blessed to be able to use my platform for, for this cause, and, and not just this cause, but hopefully it affects, you know, multiple causes, and, you know, just people's psychological issues in, in general. So um, uninterrupted came up and, and did some filming with me, so I was strapped to the microphone for 24 hours straight pretty much and for a few days and we spent three or four days doing it and uh camera crew following me around doing everything so uh we're going to be having a documentary coming out here um and i'm really really excited for it to you know it'll be a, hopefully a visual lesson we did a lot of interviews just about my everyday life and how i go about my business and, and how i manage with this stuff and, and what we're trying to do with it and uh, just raise awareness for everyone and hopefully bring that positive light so this documentary is, is going to be huge i think um I hope people can see it and get a, like I said, a, a visual representation of, of kind of what happened. And, and hopefully they can see it and go, you know what, I, I know I've, I've been there or I've been in that hole or I, I can relate to that. And, and hopefully, you know, that allows them to, to just see it. Some people are, you know, visual learners. Some people, you know, learn audibly, you know, or they mm -hmm. maybe not learning as they experience something that way. And you maybe you're very touched by a song or you're very touched by a movie. And I really hope that this is more of that movie route where, you know, that scene where people can go, okay, like, man, like, I know what that's like. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe I need some help or, or maybe I can really help this person with it. And, and like I said, bring that positive light. And now this is LeBron James's platform yes. and um, d making the documentary. And I know part of their belief is to have, have it be told through your eyes through your like you really get letting the athletes really share their story not being manipulated by other media or something else so what was it like for you just being able to tell it kind of on your turn your yeah. terms so everything we did was on my terms which is huge because it's like this is how and and i told them to be honest with you i i said look i'm not when i do this i want to do it i don't want to I don't want to look back and say, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have maybe portrayed it even more. We got as real as it gets. So when you see this documentary, you're going to be like, there are going to be probably some parts that are maybe are not uncomfortable, but they're going to be like, wow, dude, this rude dude. You're going to see an, an inside look on an athlete from a different perspective that you've probably mm -hmm. never seen before because – like I said, this is not a, it's not a glamorous thing that I went through, and there's, there's no way that I want to portray it that way. I want to portray it as real and as, heart, as heartfelt as it was because that's what it was for me, and it, it was the darkest part of my life. So how can I now give that and, and maybe do it some justice? And that was for me to just be fully enveloped in it and, and um, you know, just portray everything I went through as, as clearly and as uh, open as I could. Yeah, that's wonderful. 
Where are we going to be able to find it? When it's so out? you can go on any of Uninterrupted's uh, social media sites. On uh, They have Twitter and Instagram. They have all the social media sites. Or you can go to uninterrupted.com, and um, they will have it all posted there. And then uh, I'll be helping promote it, and we'll have a you know a handful of people here that, that will be reaching out, and uh, hopefully we can uh, impact some lives for the better. Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, thank okay. you so yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on our show and talking with us today. It was so fun well, to have you. No, thank you for having <laughs> me. This is this is honestly the highlight of, of my off season here. This was, okay. was so much fun. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and tell everybody once again where they can follow you on social media. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at mike.marjama or on Twitter at mmarjama. That's m m a r j a m a. Uh, I'm on Snapchat too. You can find me anywhere. You can probably like google me and find me to find somewhere to, to get a hold of me i try to i try to yeah i try to put myself yeah. out there those social media sites are fine they'll reach out to me and I'm, I'm more than happy to get back to you guys and and like i said just interact with the fans and and mm-hmm. give you guys an open look at, at my everyday life and hopefully you guys can follow along and, and enjoy awesome ah, that's great well best of luck to you in the next season and thank with you. everything that you're doing it's just wonderful thank you i appreciate it yeah and uh, where can everybody follow you you can find me at hannah bee tucker on all social media platforms and you can follow me here at tom girl tv and at jj jurgens thank you guys so much for coming with us and we'll see you again here next week bye thank you from executive producers maria menounos kevin undergaro phil svitek and the entire AfterBuzz tv staff we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz tv network To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.